Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show, where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. On today's show, I have as my guest, Dr. Thaddeus Gala. Dr. Gala helps clients reverse chronic health issues. He's helped over 2,500 clients and was voted the number one chiropractor in Southern Oregon in addition to receiving the prestigious Clinical Excellence Award. He has been featured on NBC and CBS and is the keynote speaker at hospitals and medical teaching facilities. He is the, also the founder and medical director of Complete Care and the Institute of Natural Disease Reversal. On today's show, we talk about inflammation and how it plays a role in our health. We talk about symptoms like weight gain, low energy, pain, and unhealthy skin, as well as diseases like fibromyalgia and diabetes, and the underlying causes associated with chronic inflammation. So today you'll find out how inflammation may be holding you back from your health. So please enjoy the show. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Thaddeus Gala. Welcome, Dr. Gala. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, so inflammation we know is an underlying factor for so many of the diseases and symptoms associated with aging. And since none of us are getting any younger, doesn't matter what age we are, none of us are getting younger, let's talk about this today. Let's talk about inflammation and how we can get a hold of this and how it relates to different diseases. So let's sure. start off with what are some of the conditions that, that you think of, some of the symptoms that you think of when we're talking about inflammation? Sure. Well, first off, I, I think that uh, to understand what inflammation relates to, it's important to understand the different types of inflammation. Most of us have, have heard and we understand that uh, acute inflammation is when, let's say, you sprain your ankle or, or you, you bump your head on something and it swells up and you have that redness, the, the heat, the pain that goes with that. Then that's acute inflammation, which most of us are very uh, aware of. Now, the inflammation that we're talking about today is called subclinical inflammation. And you can't necessarily see it or feel it, but we know now that there's actually lab tests that you can detect it. But the, there's this low-grade inflammation that we all have it on varying levels. And one example I like to use is, is think about it uh, like, like lava below the surface, that it's this smoldering, low-grade irritant. And over time, if depending on the things that you do or don't do every day, that, that inflammation or that pressure, if you will, will slowly build up and build up until eventually you have an eruption, which leads to a, the expression is typically a chronic disease. So subclinical inflammation is what we're focusing on, and we'll, we can talk about how to measure that market and how to change it, of course. But then what happens is that over time, is if it gets high enough for long enough, will lead to chronic diseases. So you think of any, any disease in the Western, uh, you know, Western world. I'm not talking about infectious diseases like malaria or cholera or, or things like that, but uh, when we think of aging diseases, arthritis, uh, osteoporosis, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, all of those we're finding now have an underlying uh, etiology or cause, which is a, a pro-inflammatory state. Right. And so what are some of the symptoms that people should be looking for if, if they have this kind of cr chronic inflammation? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of the most common symptoms is nothing. And that's where a lot of people fall into, uh, fall into problems is because they, they, they equate with, with and I'm sure you see this every day, is people equate with how they feel with how healthy they are. And uh, I, I mean, we, we will talk about some of the more common symptoms, but but the, it, it's kind of like saying, what's the most common symptom of a heart attack? Well, it's it's a heart attack. So it, the most common symptom of inflammation is typically it's a very delayed onset, and because there's that delayed cause and effect, many people miss the boat and they end up waiting until they have a disease expression, such as, oh my gosh, I just got diagnosed with with Alzheimer's, or just got I, I'm I'm fatigued all the time, or I have this this chronic pain. Typically, that shows that you've had long-standing inflammation that finally manifested itself. But some of the more common um, symptoms can be fatigue, low energy, chronic pain, um, high blood pressure, uh, chronic headaches. Um, you know, all of the, even acne, um, poor skin health. All of those things can be related to low-grade subclinical chronic inflammation uh, that's been building over the months and, and years. 
Okay, great. And so, so now people that are watching, listening, know that if they have any of these symptoms, and certainly there could be other symptoms or no symptoms at all, or they have one of these diseases you mentioned, it sounds like we all need to be listening to this, right? And what we can do to, to decrease inflammation, look for these markers of inflammation. Well, ab absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that we're rec I mean, everyone knows that smoking isn't good for you. It's not good for your heart. Uh, it's, it's not good for your brain. It's not good for your skin. It's not good for you, period. But we know that it took years. Um, and, and, and in some cases, for, for some people, it took decades for them to become an agreement that we all, to where we all are now, that we all agree that smoking is not healthy for us. But of course, you think of the, the cause and effect of smoking. You know, just because you smoked a pack of cigarettes when you were a teenager doesn't mean that you're going to be getting lung cancer when you're older. But obviously, the longer you smoke, the higher your inflammation gets, so your risk for lung cancer and heart disease and other issues goes up. Now, the same thing with inflammation. So when you, when you have this, this, this delayed cause and effect uh, reaction of what you're doing when you're younger and how that slowly turns on chronic disease, yeah, it's something that affects all of us. I mean, you think about, you know, I, I believe that one of the statistics put out by the CDC is projecting, and the, and the um, American Diabetes Association is projecting that. Even by the year, I believe, 2030, so in the next about 15 years, they're projecting that two-thirds of the population will be diabetic or pre-diabetic. So you've got to think that the majority of people in the next uh, 15 years are going to be pre-diabetic or diabetic. And one of, one of my um, closest colleagues who, who's a, uh, a nurse practitioner at the emergency department uh, presented me with, it, with an interesting uh, stat the other day. He said, you know, he's seen studies that show that 80% of people with pre-diabetes go on to develop diabetes. And the link between hyperinsulinemia can be, has been linked to polycystic ovarian syndrome, to, to acne, poor skin health, uh, and many other health issues. So, of course, not only is diabetes a, a huge issue as related to chronic inflammation, but all the other chronic diseases that come with this. And even right now, you think of 25% of our health care costs goes just to diabetes. So if you think that 25 cents of every dollar that you spend is going to fight diabetes and related issues, that it's something that we all need to be aware of for ourselves, for our children, uh, in terms of being proactive uh, with that because of the chronic disease link and inflammation link to diabetes and all these other chronic issues that we're dealing with. Okay. So what are some of the things that cause this inflammation, the chronic inflammation? You mentioned smoking, and that's an obvious cause. Right. But what are some of the other causes? So some of the so some of the so I, I tell people this every single day you have the decision to either make yourself sicker or get healthier. And I think back when I was ten years old, I was remodeling the kitchen, getting ready for a wheelchair for my mom. And I actually found a picture uh, a couple months ago of myself. I had this fashionable pink T-shirt on, and I had a rat tail when I was 10 years old with a crowbar with my dad getting ready to, to remodel the kitchen. My mother had uh, – w- they bought a piece of property in rural Oregon, put a tent on it. They moved up from Southern California, no running water, no electricity. They bought a chainsaw and said, we have to build a house before winter comes. So here's my mom and dad working sun up to sundown, building a, a ranch. You know, it, was, it was a little house in the prairie type, type uh, living. And in about four months, when I was about 10, my mother went from full-time working to full-time disability. And uh, she went to multiple doctors. Uh, she searched far and wide. And everyone said, sorry, there's nothing you can do. You're going to be spending the rest of your life in a wheelchair. We, we don't know what's going on. And I remember there was, there was a, uh, about a two-week period where the doctors said, you know, I think we have it narrowed down. You either have lupus or you have bone cancer. We'll let you know in, in about a week or so when the test comes back. So, of course, our family was on pins and needles during, during that time. And um, later it turned out that she had fibromyalgia. She kept looking for solutions. She had chronic fatigue. I mean, she couldn't even, uh, you know, a good day for her, her was she could go down and check the chickens and come back. And that was the extent of her day. But my mother started on this path. And she found someone locally that was that was versed enough in natural solutions, started reversing her chronic inflammation, and started on this path. And this was, uh, you know, decades ago. So now you fast forward. I've spent my my life since I've been since I was ten. It's my professional life has been dedicated towards finding out how to reverse chronic inflammation and how to reverse chronic disease naturally. So again, I would say first off, understand that every single day people can either be moving towards sickness or towards health. 
And with that, some of the most powerful ones, and I'm probably going to probably going to break some hearts here. The most uh, the most inflammatory common foods include dairy products, grain products, refined oils, and sugars. And those account for about 72% of the average person's diet. And I know that's huge. And people probably are going to be listening to us thinking, oh my gosh, well, what am I supposed to eat? And, and they think, oh, well, I do gluten-free. Well, we know that isn't, isn't good enough because we know that, that grains, seeds, legumes, beans, lentils are typically very pro-inflammatory uh, along with, again, processed omega-6 vegetable oils. Um, of course, trans fats and, and sugars are some of the biggest inflammatory foods. And just getting that out you know, in, in a month or two, uh, you can see, you know, I've seen I've seen, seen people lose anywhere from five to to forty seven pounds in in two months. Their their chronic fatigue goes away, their inflammation goes down, their their chronic pain, and they they start feeling better uh, almost immediately within the first couple weeks or first few months. Okay, so diet plays a huge role in inflammation, and you mentioned some of the foods that you think really increase inflammation. Um, what are some other things in, in addition to diet? Is there other things that you think increase inflammation? It, absolutely. So the other things that increase inflammation, uh, and, and first off, I tell people that I, I say diet accounts for probably about 70 to 80 percent of their health. The, uh, the other things, of course, that play a huge role in that can be emotional stress. So whether you're stressed out at job, you're, you're stressed out at home, uh, stressed out with, with finances, uh, an emotional trauma, all of that can, can elevate uh, different inflammatory inflammatory chemicals. So the emotional stress of it, of course, environmental toxins. Uh, so if you you know obviously just just look around your vi- environment, and obviously we're exposed to you know as you know we're exposed to chemicals all day long by either what we're putting on our body uh, from the pans that we eat for, eat out of or the the plastic bottles that we're that we're consuming food from. So those toxins are are all over the place. Uh, the other thing, of course, would be would be exercise. Obviously, everyone knows exercise is good for you. Clean air, clean water. Uh, those would be some of the biggest ones where you have the biggest levers and impacts. So obviously not smoking, exercising, uh, reducing stress in your life, avoiding environmental toxins and having a clean, healthy environment. Um, and then the biggest one that I'm a proponent of is nutrition because it, mo- most people will find a reason or excuse to not exercise. But most people will not find a reason to not eat for a month because a lot of people can go a month without exercise, but, but no one can go a month without eating uh, intentionally and, and, uh, and, and still be functioning at the end of that time. Okay, great. So um, you mentioned the foods that are, are more pro-inflammatory. What are some anti-inflammatory foods? What are foods that we should be eating? So the foods that I suggest people not be, or, uh, be eating – so, so to be clear, the foods that I suggest people do consume and eat more would be typically foods without a label that don't come in a package. So when you think of your grocery store, you think of the aisles. So you think of your lean, uh, lean grass-fed meats, uh, your omega-3 eggs, uh, lots of, of fresh produce, and then occasional fruit. And typically that will have a huge impact on, on people's inflammation. Again, I, I, one, one of my favorite professors when I was in, when in school years ago said – Stay away from the aisles in the grocery store. The aisles are death. Stay away from the aisles. Stay on the on the perimeter and where your meats and, and veggies are, and that'll be a huge change and a huge improvement just by consuming more of those foods. Okay, great. And you mentioned uh, other things that are particularly helpful are um, making sure your environment's clean. Anything else you want to say about that? I mean, I think that the you know, clean water, cl- clean air, obviously, are really important places to start. Anything else that you would suggest around environmental issues? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it can be situational, of course. If someone, you know, if someone's living in a, uh, you know, in a, in a in a city or near an industrial part, you know, obviously that that's that's something completely different. But yeah, I would say go through and. And as best you can, try to clean up your body uh, and your environment and your space from, um, you know, trying to get back to a more natural state. So looking for, you know, if you're using shampoos and conditioners and soaps, trying to find things that are more natural, which even that can be confusing because, you know, so many things have the label natural on it today that it can be overwhelming. And and you look on the back of the label and you can't even read or understand half the chemicals in there, but it says natural on it. So getting back, you know, a lot of people even just using, you know, instead of your average lotion, if you don't have a good quality lotion that you can understand what what it's in it, even using something like coconut oil can be very healthy. Um, you know, a, a glass water bottle versus a plastic water bottle uh, that that's reusable, and they, they have some now that are great that have, you know, it's a it's a glass water bottle, 
but it'll have like a rubberized protectant around it so it'll be durable. You can take it to the gym, throw it in your car, wherever you go. So, so looking through your day, trying to get rid of the plastics, the chemicals, um, uh, you know, even, you know, I, I'm not the one that's necessarily versed on um, uh, radiation and, or uh, electromagnetic fields from, but you think about the cell phones that we're having now um, and, and how that, you know, people with Bluetooth and, and cell phone inf- uh, radiation uh, as well as uh, wireless internet and all these, all these things that we have, we ha- don't have a long enough time span to really test and see how our bodies respond to that. Both really both short and long term, and the effects just like smoking. It took years, but now we all know that it that it's extremely harmful. Uh, you know, obviously, just like you know, other other big ones. You know, DDT, Agent Orange. You know, it's just a matter of time before we find that our bodies do much better when we're chemically free. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's back up for a minute. I want you to some of the things that you talked about that are related to inflammation. Some people might have a hard time understanding the connection. So let's talk about weight gain and how that is associated with inflammation. Sure. So we, we know now that inflammation, myself and other researchers, have now uh, de- uh, determined that in that fat or adipose tissue is now considered as its own endocrine organ and that it literally secretes and it pumps inflammation into the blood, different cytokines and different inflammatory chemicals. So if you know if you get a think if you're 10 to 15 pounds overweight, that that can actually lead um, to, to to more inflammation in your body, and there's certain markers for that. There's certain lab tests. One of them, uh, which which I know the American Heart Association and the the CDC issued about, it's been about 12 or 13 years ago, issued a joint statement saying that hsCRP should be tested for for health, and and, and many studies recognize that more than cholesterol. Now everyone's had their, you know, heard of cholesterol or had their cholesterol checked, but very few people, even healthcare providers are even aware of HSCRP, let alone have it tested or test for it in their patients. So getting your HSCRP tested as well as your homocysteine and a few other inflammatory markers um, are crucial for that. And we know that when you lose weight and you increase lean mass, that HSCRP and inflammatory chemicals start to reduce and start to drop off uh, in your body and in uh, and in, in studies that that's been clearly defined. So when you think about all the things that people say, oh yeah, you don't want to be overweight because it affects your heart, it affects your joints, it affects your brain, all these things because of the inflammatory link. So when you're overweight, your body produces more inflammation, which increases your your risk for chronic diseases, uh, you know, including you know oftentimes polycystic ovarian syndrome, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, you know, etc. All those kind of things. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and then another thing that is you um, have talked to us about is low energy, right? Fatigue being being a, um, a sign of inflammation. How is that connected? So the a lot a lot of the people that we help, uh, especially with my mother's history of fibromyalgia, and, and now I guess I should have finished that story. Now my, my mother is sixty seven years old. Uh, she's our lead health coach. She's on zero medications, and she just started running five k races a couple years ago and winning them in her age group. So she's awesome, and and certainly not only uh, you know one of my initial in, inspirations, but ongoing because of seeing how healthy she is. So as a result of all the all the work and years of research that we've done, is we've naturally gravitated. Uh, you know, we have the, this huge fibromyalgia type following, which people with fibromyalgia, of course, uh, the, the, you can think of the chronic th- the things with that is chronic fatigue, chronic pain, uh, fibro fog, which is the ment- the, the the clarity and, and confusion, um, uh, at low, low energy, poor sleep. All of that can be bundled together. So you think of like someone from my, for instance, my mom. She's never been overweight, and my mom has always been been fairly thin and and, and lean, but her inflammation was very high. So when you have, I mean, I remember my my mother when she was uh, when she was at her worst. I mean, now she's in in complete remission. I mean, she doesn't have any any symptoms. But now, if she goes back to some of her inflammatory ways, let's say that, that if she's out traveling or something, and she and she has maybe some food or that that's inflammatory, or she doesn't get a good night's sleep, she will she can start to feel a little bit of her symptoms start to come out of remission. But right now, she's 100% remission. So we know that when your inflammation rises, your 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 it's it's almost as though your body's sick all the time. So you think think about the last time that you were sick, and how your body was tired and fatigued. So when you think about how fatigued you are when you're sick, when your inflammation rises, 
it's just, it it's it's the same thing. Your body thinks that it's sick, so it goes into into uh, kind of repair this repair mode. So think about how fatigued you are when you're battling the flu, or when you have a temperature, or when you have a cold, and you just ache and you just feel miserable, and everything is sore. Well, that's because your whole body's inflammation is up because it's trying to fight off uh, the infection. But what happens is. If you, if you live a very pro-inflammatory life, your body is expressing that chronic inflammation all the time. So it's almost as though your body feels like you have this low-grade sickness all the time, which will zap all your energy, which will lead you to having low energy, fatigue, uh, being miserable, uh, poor sleep, which can lead to, to poor mental clarity throughout the day. And it just, you know, it's like a dog chasing his tail and it just snowballs because if you have low energy, you're not going to be getting exercise. You're probably going to be looking for quick foods to eat. So you're eating junk. That's going to affect your inflammation more. You're not going to sleep well. You're going to wake up uh, demotivated and not being able to get going. So you really j- just kind of snowball downhill by, by when you get in that cycle. Then, of course, the other way around, once you start making anti-inflammatory choices, you start bringing your inflammation down, you get your energy back, and you can start, you know, success breeds further success. You start getting better, and you can start seeing amazing changes. And, you know, I've seen some people make changes in a, in a day or two and see results. Some people in a couple months, depends on how inflamed they are, and then, of course, how, how much they work towards reducing their inflammation. Right. Okay, great. So it can make a big difference in the way we feel. We reduce inflammation. It can make a difference in the way we feel. Also, the way that we look, too. Skin was another thing that you mentioned. And a lot of people, a lot of doctors think of, of skin problems. Unhealthy skin is something that's external only. Uh, right. and, but, but you and I know that the, a lot of this comes from within. That, that appearance of our skin comes from inflammation within. So we, we talk about that some. Yeah, I, I think one of the um, you know one of the one of the great studies that, that I I love and love to reference was by um, Dr. Lauren Cardane. It was, it was acne vulgaris, uh, and he he coined it um, I think a disease of Western civilization, and he found that um, basically people that followed this you know that there's still like even I think it was in um, it was either I think it was maybe in Peru that there was this hunter gatherer society that didn't eat these processed foods, was free of these environmental toxins, and led a essentially very anti-inflammatory life, very low glycemic index, low life, and they had zero reported cases of any acne throughout throughout the entire span. I think they they followed these people for I think 816 days, and I think there was over I think two or three hundred people that they followed. Uh, and there was zero. There were zero cases of acne. So you think about the the skin health. Uh, you know, here in the here in the Western world, I think you know anywhere from I think forty to fifty percent of Americans experience experience acne at some time in their life, and especially a lot of adults deal with that. So when you think of one of the most common uh, skin issues that we have, either acne or dry skin, that it typically stems from a handful of things. One of them is at leading a pro-inflammatory life or a high insulin type response, which we know that grains have a high insulin or seeds. And dairy, even though dairy is low on the glycemic index and low, dairy has a high insulin index, uh, which can promote the hyperkeratization of your of your cells, which leads to a poor uh, the, the way that your skin cells are supposed to grow and then slough off and grow and slough off. It it disrupts that process, so it gets trapped. And then you have an overproduction of uh, of of fat, which then gets trapped, and then bacteria develops, which is why you see people recommend antibacterial things for for acne. But what happens is. It all stems from an overproduction at too fast production is typically responded by insulin that your skin cells don't slough appropriately, that then it, it, it becomes uh, blocked, which then allows the bacteria to, to form. So until you get to the root cause, which is typically the inflammation, people have poor, ins- poor, uh, poor, poor skin health and acne. We know, that, of course, free radical damage. So not getting enough uh, antioxidants in your diet and your body can lead to, to free radical damage and poor score poor skin health, one of the biggest things is you think about people that smoke and you think about their skin. I mean, you, you, I mean, it's, it's almost uh, ubiquitous now that when you see someone that smoked for a long time, you can look and, you, and their skin looks very unhealthy. And that's a, that's a hallmark sign of someone that smoked for a long time because of the, the inflammation and the free radical damage that's taking place. So, uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of lots of different colorful fruits and vegetables and, of course, lots of berries. And then supplementing with an awesome antioxidant, uh, you know, on a regular basis can really help with skin health because of the free radical damage. So again, I would say to help have good healthy skin, you know, increase your omega three intake. Uh, you, you know, if you if you have a, if you can't find a good skincare product, which uh, you know I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of input on that, which I, I'd even love to hear. Um, but the, you know, coconut oil, I'm a big fan of um, taking an antioxidants. 
And then, of course, a wide variety of uh, bioflavonoids and antioxidants that you get from fruits uh, and vegetables. Again, the wide color because that, that will really help with skin health. And I, I like to think of it as, as your teeth and your skin are the windows into your health. And to really look and see about your health, it'll typically be expressed with your, by your skin and your teeth. So if your teeth are, are healthy um, and your skin is healthy, that means typically that, that you're doing a good job. Great. So, and with skin, it's it's really pretty obvious. It's it's one of those things that's just right there in front of us. And so, not only should we not have acne and um, just different health um, skin issues, but we want it to be radiant and glowing, and you know those sorts of things. Now, with teeth, uh, let's talk about that. What are some of the things that people look for with their teeth? Well, it was interesting. I was talking to one of my uh, one of my colleagues, uh, and he's, he's a dentist. And I, I forget the exact number, but he was saying at um, at a, a certain pH level, your teeth will either either start to erode and decay, or at a certain pH level, they'll actually start to rebuild. So he was he was um, suggesting and, and providing some evidence and research to show that your teeth can actually start to rebuild and you can start to undo some damage, which a lot of people initially thought that wasn't possible. So I would say a couple things. If you if you need to have a, a great study that, that I love, if people if people like to read and like to research, there's a great uh, quick. Uh, it's, it's a small book, but it's called Pottinger's Cats. It's an awesome book that was that was come out. Are you familiar with, with that book or heard it? it? It's one of one of my favorites to reference people to. Um, but I would say a couple things. If if you have if you ever had braces or if your teeth aren't aren't straight, then that typically suggests one of two things: either your grandmother and or your mother and or you had high inflammation and, and, and poor diet growing up. Because we know that if you have, uh, uh, research shows that if you have a healthy grandmother and healthy you, or a healthy mother and then healthy you, that you can have a very, um, very um, healthy uh, teeth production. You don't have the crowding and, and the need for, uh, for, for braces down the road. So that can give you a window into your past. Going further, of course, cavities are going to be a huge aspect from that. Now, I'm, I'm not a dentist nor am I pretending to be, but we know that there's plenty of research to suggest that by, by having a, um, a healthy anti-inflammatory diet, which again is, is lumped in all the things we talked about, can, and a healthy inflammatory lifestyle can reduce your risk of, of future cavities and then, of course, all the complications that come from, uh, from that dental health. I mean, and you think about um, you know, how many you know, hunter-gatherer societies that that don't have any, you know, you can go far back as Western A. Price and the work he did in the 20s as, as a dentist. And, you know, uh, um, that's a very difficult book to read. Do not, I would not recommend reading that book. That one is that one is tough to get through. But he found that people that, that remained on a very natural hunter-gatherer type, type um, diet or the paleo diet, if you will, did very well. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't have any cavities. They didn't have any dental crowding or the need for braces. And, um, and and their their teeth and their hygiene was wonderful. And of course, they had no dentists. They didn't even have dentists then, and they didn't have ways to brush their teeth. But now, of course, that's a huge part of our, our our society. We're told we're supposed to get our teeth cleaned every six months. You know, you go in and get cavities. You know, so many people get braces, but that's all treating the symptom. It's not getting to the cause, which is what we're of course talking about today. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I think uh, with teeth, it's just not one of the things. It's kind of like skin, but maybe even more so that, you know, we go in to see dentists and orthodontists and they just fix it all up. They make it look good and we don't think about right. what is causing that. And so certainly it makes sense. Just just like other parts of our body are going to grow and, you know, be healthy. We certainly want our teeth to be that way too. And, and I know that uh, you mentioned the pH, and so what what should the pH be in in the mouth? I mean, is that something that you know that you could share with I, us? Sure, and so so don't quote me on this, but I believe that that the pH in the mouth that he was recommending, I I believe it was either four point five or five point four. I have to mm -hmm. check on that again. Mm -hmm. But he was saying that at at when if your if your mouth is too acidic, then you'll you'll demineralize, and above that you'll remineralize. And that's the way that the pH works in terms of, of the mineral the mineral balance and so forth. So that's the point that he was saying. You know, one thing you can do is is get some home you know pH uh, test strips, and you can check your pH uh, you know in the morning throughout the day and, and see where you're at. And you can see, and you can kind of monitor that. And if your body's and you have to think, what are the foods that are acidic? Well, grains, 
uh, sugars and meats are typically very acidic when they get absorbed and processed in the body. Now, of course, you know, you may be asking, well, I recommended meats. Well, I did, but we also know that fruits and vegetables are very uh, alkaline. So we know that if you balance the fruits and vegetables with lean meats, then your body is typically into a more of a pH type balance. And so then you're, you're, you're no, more normal. But if you eat heavy grains and heavy meats uh, and dairy, then you're going to be very acidic. Uh, and of course, uh, conversely, if you eat, eat very high, uh, you know, vegetables and, and fruits, you're going to be very alkaline. So that'd be the balance. So that's why, you know, typically people that eat lean meats, um, fruits and vegetables do really well in terms of maintaining the balance. But if you get a pH strip and you start testing, most people will be pretty surprised as where they are. And you can go, I think on Amazon or, you know, online and you can get a, a bottle of test strips. That's pretty, pretty cheap. And you can, I just keep it by, uh, just in, by the, in the bathroom, and I and do a combination of checking um, uh, my saliva pH and my urine to see how uh, how my health is throughout the day. That's just another barometer that I use uh, in addition to, to lab tests to see how my health is do, is doing. Right, and I'm and those dietary suggestions are important. I also think I think when I think of it, people having a really acidic mouth, if it's too acidic, I think of people having maybe heartburn, reflux. Those kinds of things where it, the you know, acid's coming up into the mouth, making it more acidic in addition to what we're eating. So would, would you recommend people also ad- adjust um, their, you know, look at their digestive system, their gut health, and, and balancing that as well? Oh, you know, absolutely. And, and typically, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a great point. And I think one of, one of the things to, to keep in mind is that um, typically when you get your body's inflammation down, uh, things like GERD, uh, will, and, and acid reflex and so forth will start to resolve. Uh, you know, I, I just think back of one of my um, one of my very first assistants uh, when I got into practice. She came in and she get, and, and she listened and she would follow me with every patient every day. So she she got to hear the same kind of speech about inflammation and diet and GERD and all this stuff that we talked about. That. And so she brought her husband in after about a month of working there, saying, "Okay, you have to come in. And you have to listen." And when we started, if, if memory serves me right, he when he when we started with him, he had he had very severe bloating, GERD, uh, inflammation, and, and digestive issues, and he was limited to two foods: bananas, and chicken breasts, and that was just about all that he could eat that wouldn't disrupt his stomach. We started working with him slowly, get his inflammation down, and now his GERD is completely gone. He he has a huge wide of food range of foods that he can eat. He doesn't feel bloated anymore. Uh, you know, normal bowel habits, all of that has resolved as a result. So now, you know, he's seen major results in health uh, improvements just by getting his inflammation down. His GERD was able to resolve. So, uh, you know, in the case of that, it's kind of, you know, the, the, the chicken or the egg. But again, it comes back to the same thing. Live a very de-stressed life. You know, you want to increase exercise, healthy supplements, good nutrition, you know, good social support, good clean water, and your body's inflammation will resolve. And and typically, uh, you know, the vast majority of people's health issues will reduce or completely resolve if they do those things. And it will have a huge positive impact on their health. Right. Excellent. Yeah, and and you know, I think so much of what you're talking about is important and I think with with the aging process, the inflammation you mentioned that that can speed up our signs of aging too. So we all want to, you know, we want to look look um at least our age maybe not even younger. Um we don't want to look any older than we are. And so let's talk a little bit more about inflammation and aging. Right. So, you know, and, and that goes back, you know, one of the one of the big things is that we know that uh, even calorie restriction leads to leads to prolonged life. So obviously the more calories that you consume or, you know, and typically when people are overweight, they're, they're, they've consumed more calories or the, or the wrong type of calories, that that will speed up cellular division and it'll speed up the aging process. And we know that your cells can only divide and reproduce so many times. You have a, a finite number. Now, of course, there's some research right now. I know, uh, you know, Peter Diamandis and, and some of these other people. I, I know P- Peter Diamandis was, is, is projecting that the, um, you know, 100 uh, is the new 65. Um, I'm projecting that 150 is the new 65. And, of course, you have, uh, uh, you know, Audrey de Grey that, that is predicting 1,000. Uh, you know, being the the first sixty five. You know, with the, with the extent of where where technology is gro- is how fast technology is going today, and with the advances that we have, if you keep your body as healthy as you can for as long as you can, you'll be ready for those those upgrades, so to speak, when we can start d- developing. You know, three D printing for body organs, um, nanotechnology for 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 nutrient delivery, all those kind of things. 
that your body will be better equipped to, to avoid uh, the aging process, including potentially even reversing uh, you know, the, the telomere fraying and, and, and cleaving that takes place to actually prolong and extend uh, life extension. So by doing all of these things, again, reducing your calories, reducing your stress, reducing your inflammation, we know that that, can, that will prolong um, the, your, your life. And of course, we can look at that, the, uh, the Okinawans and, and a lot of these other long-living societies that have these, you know, and you look at some of these key factors. Great social network, you know, they're they're very they're very engaged with their families and their social networks. Which, of course, today we're, you know, uh, one of the things that, that I I tell people when I go out to dinner with them or with them with them a group, everyone has to take their cell phone and put it face down, and the first, and, you know, they just stack them in the middle, and the first person to pick up their cell phone during dinner has to pay for the bill. So. What what happens is is we're forcing people to to create more real engagements, you know. And you see these kids today that that they're they're you know they're they're doing this all day long, or even during dinner they're doing this. And of course, you know, me being a chiropractic background, of course, then that's going to affect a lot of issues with the neck and the back. And we can go have a whole other talk just on that. But we know that that um, having good social interaction, keeping your inflammation down, low stress, good supplements, um, you know, and having balance in your life will extend and prolong the aging process, which again, if you're aging too fast, it'll show in your skin, uh, your, your health, of course, your, your, your teeth, and, and show up in many other chronic ways as well. Yeah, excellent. Okay, really great information. How do people find out more about you? And you also have, you have a free guide to reversing disease, right? Do you have a... We do, yeah. They they can go to, to drthadgala.com. So actually, it's D-R-T-H-A-D-G-A-L-A.com. So drthadgala.com. And there, there, yeah, there's some re- free resources on there. There's some videos. There's a, there's a guide uh, with as well as some meals and recipes as well as uh, kind of a summary of really what we've talked about today that people can can go through and get a lot more information if they're if they're wanting or looking to to create that uh, that health and that vibrance in their life and looking great, feeling great, youthful, and uh, and 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 getting to that next hundred or hundred and fifty of quality years, uh, so they can be they can be on that trend of a long quality life. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Gala. It's been great having you on. A lot of great information here. And thank you for being such a great, a valuable resource and having that information on your website, too. Awesome. Thank you. And likewise, you keep up the good work. I, I love the work that you're doing. And, and thanks for having me on today. Excellent. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Thaddeus Gala. And for more information about Dr. Gala, you can visit my website, drtrevorcates.com. Go to the podcast page with his interview, and you'll find the information and links there. And I love your feedback. So please send me a Facebook me- message at Dr. Trevor Cates and let me know your thoughts about this and other shows. You can also go to iTunes and subscribe to the Spa Doctor podcast. Thank you and have a great day. <music>